Welcome to Grace. I'm Pastor Brooks. I'll be bringing you the word this morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilbaugh, for filling in last week as I was on the Perspectives Tour, teaching in Quad Cities and then Des Moines and then also in Iowa City. So it was a busy weekend for me last week, but it's good to be back in, um, in Daniel. And uh, if you're a visitor, welcome to Grace Community Church. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I'd love to meet you. Um, the welcome team and myself will be out front, uh, the information desk. As you first come in, you see that, and as you exit, it'll be on your right. So if you're a, a visitor, we'd love to meet you, so come up and, and uh, introduce yourself, and I'll introduce myself, and I don't bite, at least not on Sundays. Mondays, I will bite, but not on Sundays. So good to, good to have you here. Open up your Bibles to, uh, to Daniel chapter 7. We're continuing, <clears throat> we're continuing our series in the book of Daniel, and, and we're making a transition. Uh, there's a natural break. There's a natural transition in the flow of, uh, of the book that's distinct and it's different. And, and so this morning, this message is going to bridge Daniel 1 through 6 and the rest of Daniel, Daniel 7 through 12. So, but I want to start with a question which is very personal in nature and that's, I want you to think about what's in your future. Now, in, in one sense, you can't know what's in your future. Um, you cannot know what tomorrow holds for you, but you have an idea of what you'd like the future to look like. So what's your vision for the future? Uh, if you're a young high school student uh, or elementary school student or junior high, you're probably thinking just the next few years down the road if, or maybe just what's on the agenda for this afternoon. But uh, later you start to think about things beyond that. You have goals, you have dreams, you have aspirations. And, and in college, you're thinking about the career that you want after college or, or the goals that you have for yourself. Maybe there's, you, know, you envision maybe having a family and raising a family. If you're in the midst of that, you're looking at the season of life that you're in now and you're looking towards uh, the future. When the kids grow up, you want your kids to be successful you want them to do well, you, and all of those things. And you want to be secure financially. You want, you want to have, uh, you have different health goals for yourself. You'd like to, to, to grow old uh, and, and be well as you grow old. You have all sorts of different things. So think about that in terms of the immediate future, the next couple of years, and decades from now. What's the vision for your future? Okay, you got, you got that in your mind's eye? Now think of this. What are the things which threaten that future? We'll call them vision crushers. Vision crushers. In Genesis chapter 3, you have uh, Adam and Eve, and, and they sin, and they fall, and rebellion, sin and rebellion enters the world. And, and in, in verses 14 through 24, God comes to them after the fall, and, and they have this little dialogue. Uh, why are you hiding? Did you eat from the tree? Well, she made me eat. Well, the serpent you put in the garden, he, he made me eat. There's blame shifting. And, and God, I know he wasn't rubbing his temples, but this is an anthropomorphism here. So he's kind of like, oh, I told you this was going to happen if you did this. Now that you've sinned, death has entered the world. And here's, what it's gonna, here's, here's how it's going to flesh out. Um, Eve, it's going to be hard for you. You're going to give birth in pain. And uh, um, you're... Your, your descendants are going to be at war with the, the descendants of the serpent, and it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And your desire, Eve, is going to be for your husband. And no, that doesn't mean you're going to think he's hot. It means that you're going to want to rule over him, but he's going to be a pinhead, and he's going to uh, be difficult to live with. And every marriage since has been exactly the same. And, uh, and then... Adam, you're going to try to work the ground and you're going to try to do the things that I entrusted to you before the fall, only now they're going to be much, much more difficult. Everything you do is going to fight against you. Uh, the ground's going to be hard. There's going to be blood. There's going to be sweat. There's going to be toil. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. In other words, the vision that you had for yourself, it's not going to work out the way you thought it would because of sin. And we have common difficulties because of sin. You know, you have these great envision, you have these plans for you and your family and, and your future, and, and then 10 years into marriage or even 20 years into marriage, your spouse comes to you and says, I don't love you anymore, I don't want to be married. And all of a sudden, everything that you planned is just like come to a dead halt and you don't know what to do. Your, your future's, it just, it, it's not, it's painful. 
Or, or you, you've been to the doctor and you get that call and it says, we need you to come back in because the diagnosis, the, the little tumor or the little, little uh, skin tag, it, it's, it's malignant. And all of a sudden now everything's up, on, up in the air and you don't know what tomorrow holds. Or you have, you have, you have dreams, you have visions of, of financial peace and prosperity in the future and the economy drops and your company, which was so secure, all of a sudden it's not anymore and you don't have a job. Or the job that you have is not with the job that you used to have. And everything in the, in the, on the horizon, you were so confident when you were younger. You were so certain that things were going to work out your way and nothing's working out. And those are just the common everyday, everyday run-of-the-mill issues that probably described almost half the people here. There's relational issues. To one degree or another, they're disappointing. There's health issues. To one degree or another, they're, they're threatening. And by the way, just a newsflash, you're all going to die eventually. And then, and then there's, there's, there's issues of, of security and peace, and, and, and you, they're tenuous at best. You, they just slip through your fingers. So the idea that the future is, is, is definite, even though we want to make sure... By the way, we have real choices. We can, we can do things to prepare for the future up to a point, but there are certain things which are just not in our control. And those are common difficulties. And add on to that, oh no, add on to that that my clicker doesn't work. <laughs> So I don't know if we could resync that or just if you could advance it for me, the next slide. You have compound difficulties. Um, so we're all born in a context where things are relatively good for us as citizens of the United States of America. Even though it's not a perfect system and we can see all the flaws and all our leaders and the way things work, it is a relatively stable country and things are relatively stable. But that's not true in most places in the world. Uh, there's compounded difficulties, not to mention just, you know, the sin, the sickness, the relational strife, and so forth. But if you're born into, let's say that you're born into Syria in the 1980s, and you're an adult now, and you're trying to raise your kids, but you live in a refugee camp on, on, the, uh, on the eastern edge of, of Egypt, how hard you work and how righteous you try to be, your future is upended. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You know, in America, we like to talk about the American dream, you know, work hard, do the right thing, and it'll work out. Well, for some people, that's not true. You can work hard, all hard as you want in a refugee camp, but there is no future, so to speak, the way we think of planning our future. Or maybe you're a kid born into Calcutta, India, where your parents live in a slum and for, for you and your family to subsist uh, on, on, and, and exist... You have to go to the dump every day to dig up food and things that you can sell. So we can talk all we want about, you know, working hard and, and, and personal responsibility. There are some compounded difficulties that add on to, add on to the run-of-the-mill stuff that we all deal with. And, and the, future, the future is very, very bleak for some people. You know, if you live in a culture where you have systemic or, or institutional oppression or injustice, we don't in the United States. I mean, we did, depending on your race. A couple hundred years ago, you born into slavery in the South. What, what hope is, I mean, what's your future? What's your future? You, you get the idea? So it depends, it depends. So the point is, we're not in control. I mean, we're in control of some things. We're responsible human beings with, with, when we make real choices and they have real consequences for good and for bad. But ultimately, there is a great many of variables that we have absolutely no control over. And the question is, where is your hope when, on the, when in the forecast, all you see is pain? Where's your hope? Those are the questions that, 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 uh, that you have to be prepared to deal with. Now, in our context, in our culture, when, when you're relatively, you got it good right now, when you think about things which are painful in the future, you tend to not want to think about them. So you avoid even dealing with them. Now, when you're in those uncommon or compound difficulties, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. But we can entertain ourselves and get our minds off of those things in our context but ultimately, we, we can't change the future. So where is your hope when pain 
is in the forecast. Now, I know this is a longer introduction, but bear with me. It'll, I'm going to draw it together here in a second. When my daughter, Caitlin, who is now 21, was about five or six or so, she used to ask all sorts of questions about the immediate future, stuff that her father could not answer. Like, if, if it was all, at all cloudy and it started rain, she would kind of go, is there going to be a thunderstorm? Is there going to be a thunderstorm? Is there going to be a tornado? I don't know. I don't, I don't, probably not. Or if I would say no, she would ask, well, what percentage are you sure? Because you know on the Weather Channel, it'll say 80%, you know, probability for a, for a thunderstorm. And, and then, then uh, if we were going to get on the plane to go see my mom who lived in, in St. Petersburg, Florida back in the day, we'd get on the plane and she'd, she'd be sitting there and she's white knuckling it and she's nervous. She's like, is this plane going to crash? And um, how, how, parents, you've had kids that have asked those questions, right? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Let me ask you this. Do you tell your kid everything's going to be okay? Do you tell your kid everything's going to be okay? Why? You have no idea if it's going to be okay. <laughs> I'm dead serious. You know what I used to, Some of you are going to think you're a horrible parent, and I'm glad that you're not my kid's parent because you're an idiot. But you know what I would tell my daughter? She'd say, Dad, are are we going to die? I would say, absolutely. I have, there's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> so you're going to die. Mom's going to die. Your brother's going to die. I'm going to die. Grandma's going to die. Dog's going to die. Everybody's going to die. And she'd roll her eyes and say, Dad, I know we're all going to die. <laughs> I mean, are we going to die today? And I'd say, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. And, and it was kind of a game. But the point, there's a, there's a, there's a method to the madness here. It's, it's to stop speaking fluff to your children. You don't know. You don't know. And, but I would, t I would say, essentially, here, here's the point I'm getting at. My daughter's hope could not be in the trustworthiness of the pilot. I don't know the pilot. I don't know. Maybe he downed a fifth of vodka with some orange juice before he got on the plane. They do that. Hopefully not often, but they do. They're human beings. I have no idea who's flying this plane. You know, and, and then it's like, well, I can't, what about the, her hope can't be in the, in the trustworthiness of the weather because the weather changes. How many of you saw the movie Sully? Okay, they took off and what happened? A bird went in the engine, a whole flock of them, and the engines went out. You can't plan for that. You can't plan for that. You just don't know. You don't know. Can't be in the trustworthiness or the integrity of the plane. I don't know what's going to happen. Things break. Can't even, her trust can't even be in the trustworthiness of her father. I don't know what's going to happen, honey. I don't. I don't know. So where is our hope when pain might be on the horizon? Her hope, my hope, your hope needs to be not in any of the things which we can't control, but in our Father in heaven who knows the beginning from the end. So here's the answer to the question. Is the plane going to crash? Probably. I don't know. But I do know there is a God in heaven and he's my dad. Amen. And he's your dad. And if he should choose to bring us home and this plane doesn't land on the runway, but it lands somewhere else and and under really bad circumstances, we'll be with him instantly. And it'll be a lot better than grandma's house. I mean, that's reality. That's reality. Daniel 7 through 12 addresses a very uncertain and a very, very troubling future for Daniel and his people. Dad, is the plane going to crash? Uh, let, me, let me give you the, the metaphor. Yeah. In fact, five or six planes are going to go up and they're all going to come down in hurtling balls of flame. One after another. In succession. It's going to be awful. But I'm going to rule and I'm going to reign and my people are going to come through that. So... In the immediate sense, Daniel has no control of the future, and neither do you, neither do I. But in the grand scheme of things, 
the future is absolutely secure. Does that make sense? So here's where we're going with Daniel. Uh, open up your... Uh, ah, jumping ahead of myself. Open up... Uh, ah, push the correct button. There we go. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Let me just read for you verses 1 through 15, which is kind of an introduction to where we're headed. We'll pray and we'll just uh, we'll jump into it. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream, visions of his head as he lay in his bed, and then he wrote down a dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another, and the first was like a lion, it had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. And it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise and devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke into pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And it was different from all the other beasts that were before it. It had ten horns, and I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from them another horn, a little one, before which of its three horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in the horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth, speaking great things. Weird, huh? <laughs> Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. His wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before them. A thousand and thousands upon thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. In the court sat they sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and it was given over to be burned with fire. And as for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given a kingdom and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Father, we come to you in humility and thankfulness that you know the beginning from the end and everything in between. We thank you, Lord, that you will return and you will reign and you will give your kingdom to your people and we will reign alongside you. Uh, Father, in the meantime, we don't know what's going to happen. And as we look at this vision and the other visions and the rest of Daniel, Lord, give us discernment, give us wisdom that we might understand uh, the meaning of these things and that they might comfort us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified. Help me to preach and teach with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so there's a break. Daniel chapter 1 through 6, which is what we've covered so far, is by and large what, what is known as historical narrative. In other words, we read about Daniel, what he said, what he did, and what the kings that he interacted did and said. So it's history, and we read about that. We read stories about Daniel uh, interpreting different dreams and visions of Nebuchadnezzar. And we read about him being in the lion's den, and so forth and so on. And here's a summary verse, one that kind of captures the essence of what takes place in these first six chapters, Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. What we've seen by and large in Daniel chapter one through six is God is revealing to pagan kings that are unaware of his presence and existence and his reign and his dominion. He's revealing himself to these individuals. Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar, Darius, and you've seen that, okay, you've seen that, That's a, that covers a great many number of years, 
and God is revealing himself, and we're also seeing how God's people interact with others who don't share their beliefs, and we can learn a great deal from that, right? So it's historical narrative. We read about history as it happened, and, and there's a great many lessons that are there that we apply. Okay, so that's historical narrative. Now we're moving into a phase of Daniel where everything changes. It's still Daniel, but it's different now. We're not reading about events that happened and how Daniel interacted with people. Now we're reading about visions of the future that have not happened and, and what the implications are for God's people and for the world at large. It's very different. It's very different. I personally have never preached from this genre of literature. I started, I got close, and then I chickened out once. <laughs> when we went through uh, Revelation, uh, we went through the seven letters of the churches. We covered Revelation chapter one, two, and three. And as soon as we finished with three, it's kind of like, okay, that's good for now. And because the rest is apocalyptic prophecy. It has to do with the end times and things which have not yet happened didn't happen in, in John's day, and ultimately have, many of them have, most of them haven't happened in our day either. Same thing with Daniel chapter 7 through 12. A classic prophecy, which we introduced the uh, series with, uh, example here is Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 4 through 11, is character, it's very direct. It's characterized by thus saith the Lord. It's Je Jeremiah chapter 29, just before Daniel is, is, goes into exile, God tells Jeremiah, here's what I want you to tell my people. Thus saith the Lord, do not resist Nebuchadnezzar. Go willingly into exile. Go to Babylon, get married, have families, have kids, plant gardens, get jobs, and pray for the welfare of the city that you're in. For by seeking their welfare, you seek your own welfare. And at the end of the 70 years, I'm going to bring you out of Babylon back to Jerusalem. That's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? There, that's, there's no weirdness in that. It's just, it is what it is. It's very direct. And, and a great, uh, much of prophecy, classic prophecy, is that way. It deals with the future often, but it's the short-term future. Okay, when it gets longer term future, it gets, there's a lot more symbolism, there's a lot more imagery, and it's just harder to figure out how it's going to work. Why? Because it hasn't happened. And it's always easy to look in hindsight, oh, well, prophecy is easy. Well, yeah, when it's already happened. When it hasn't happened, it's a little bit more difficult. But that's classic prophecy. But we're not talking about classic prophecy, we're talking about apocalyptic prophecy. The word apocalypse means revelation. You know the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament? The book of Revelation, the word apocalypse means revelation. So it says it's John's apocalypse or John's revelation, the revelation given to John concerning things yet to be. Daniel 7 through 12 is Daniel's apocalypse. The revelation given to Daniel concerning the things that are to be. And so that's what we're going to look at in the rest of the, the, the book. It's not direct. It's indirect. It, uh, before, in classic prophecy, God comes and says, Jeremiah, here's what I want you to say. In apocalyptic prophecy, God gives Daniel and also John in, in Revelation or some other, there's other apocalyptic literature, Zechariah, Ezekiel. Anyway, he gives the prophecy a vision or a dream. They then write that vision down and now we read it. It's not as clear. It's pretty, it's, sometimes it's cryptic. It's, sometimes it's really weird. And, and it, it reads kind of crazy. And, and that's, that's where we're at. Uh, and I want to make this note. This is really important. Apocalyptic literature is pastoral in nature. Now here's what I mean by that. The word pastor, it means shepherd. It's concerned with the care of the sheep. It's concerned with protecting, providing for, and nourishing hurting people. It's pastoral in its content because the people who are reading it in the context that they're reading it are in pain and uncertainty. Now, 
We collectively, I know many of you suffer pain. We all suffer pain. And many of us have uncertain futures. But I'm just looking at all of you right now and you probably drove here in a car. You have a job. You're not digging through the slums or the, the trash for food. Uh, you're, you're probably not um, caught up in the sex industry or the sex trade. You're, you're not a, a human slave. Um, some of you might be, have some very, very difficult pasts. I'm not minimizing your past, but um, it's different. Daniel hasn't seen his home in 80 years. And he's wondering whether or not God's actually going to keep his word. The people that John gave his, his revelation to in the first century were being persecuted and mercilessly hunted down. It's different. When you read apocalyptic literature through the lens of people suffering who are not sure if the plane's going to make it, it makes sense. If, however, you read it as an affluent Westerner with too much time on your hands, which isn't really having anything to do with the Great Commission, but you're just concerned with ease and comfort, it freaks you out because you just don't want to suffer. And then you're trying to figure out if Obama or Trump or Putin's the Antichrist because you have no idea what this is for. And if I describe some of you, I kind of apologize a little bit, but not really, because you need to stop it. <laughs> more, more on that later. Um, <laughs> that's a rabbit trail. Uh, it's a fun rabbit trail, though, and I like to hunt rabbits. <laughs> kill the rabbit, kill the rabbit. It's not in the notes, and I'm not even sure why I said that, but let's move on. All right. So, you're going to have, we're going to look at four different major visions. Two of them are under the reign of Belshazzar uh, in chapter 7 and chapter 8. One is the first year of Belshazzar. The other is the third year of Belshazzar. The next, the third vision is going to come under Darius, uh, the Persian, in his first year. That'll be chapter 9. And the last vision that's going to come to Daniel is under Cyrus, the Persian. And that's going to go from chapter 10 through 12. So, there's essentially four major visions, and they're weird. And they're weird. And, and, uh, but read this from the lens of those people who are in the time that are, that are getting this and also those throughout time who are in similar circumstances that they just are beyond their control and, and their future is very painful. And it will, it will help you if you do that. Um, so let's take a look at this. First of all, making sense of the symbolism. Making sense of the symbolism. We're going to come back. By the way, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 7, 1 through 14 is the vision itself. Verses 15 through the end of the chapter is what the vision means. We're actually not going to get to what the vision means. We're going to look at next Sunday is, is, is the vision of chapter 7. We're going to break it down and look at the meaning. Today is the introduction to the genre so that we can understand how to move forward. Okay, so, so bear with me. This is a long introduction to chapter 7 through 12. But in order to do that, you need to understand how the Bible uses symbolism when it's used in this context. First of all, the symbols themselves don't refer to the, the things themselves. How many beasts were there in this vision? You remember? There was a hint. I held up four fingers. There's four. And they're weird. One looks like a lion with wings, and then it stood up like a man. The second one was like a leopard. It had four wings. And how many heads? Four heads. Don't see that in nature often, unless the leopard was born near a nuclear power plant. And, and then, then you have the third beast was like a bear. Didn't say it was a bear. It was a like a bear. And it had ribs in its teeth and was told, devour much flesh. And there was a fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, as if the other three weren't weird. This was different, completely different. Didn't even describe it like an animal because there's nothing to compare it to. But it has iron teeth. And that was neat. And it, it was devouring everything and trampling everything. It freaked Daniel out. Okay, those, those are symbols, but they are not the things themselves. They're not the things themselves. Oftentimes, they, those symbols are, they're, they're given meaning later in the text if you just keep reading. Look at verse 17. And this is, again, we'll, we'll break this out next week a little bit more, but if you look at verse 15, as for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. You think? So he's freaked out by this. And the visions of the head alarmed me. 
And I approached the one of those who stood there and I asked him the truth concerning this and he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. Verse 17, these four great beasts, they're four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Okay, stop. If you just keep reading, oftentimes the Holy Spirit will use the prophet or an angel or something to say, hey, Daniel, those represent four different kings and their kingdoms. Oh, so they're not literal beasts. No, they're not literal beasts. They're worse than the literal beasts. That's the point of symbolism. That's the point of symbolism. Uh, the symbols don't refer to things themselves. And also, the, where, where they're not immediately revealed, as in the kings are, or the four beasts are kings, those symbols are used elsewhere, and they're consistent with the usage of the symbols elsewhere in Scripture, so that we don't, we're not allowed to, or it's really, really unwise to just assign meaning randomly to symbols. I think these symbols mean this. That's probably not a wise thing to do unless you see in scripture that that's been assigned that meaning, okay? So, so be careful when you do that. And the symbols intend to inform the mind and move the emotions. Inform the mind and move the emotions. Okay, consider uh, that the reality, the reality is actually greater than the imagery. So the, the, the beasts are scary, but the reality of the kings and the kingdoms which they represent are actually far more scary than the dream, than the vision. Does that make sense? But here's the problem. When you look at historical data, it's generally not, it doesn't inspire you with awe. How many of you, when you just went to history class, you're just blown away? Raise your hand. Some of you were because you really love history. Others of you found it really, really boring, right? Okay, if, if God just comes to Daniel and says, Daniel, there's going to be four great kings and four kingdoms and they're going to conquer this much territory and here's going to be the number of their armies and, and how many years. They, it's, it's kind of like in any reign from 1776 until this and that. And you're like, oh, can I go back to bed now? <laughs> but when it's four different beasts and one of them has iron fangs and there's blood dripping off of it and he's crushing everything, you're kind of like, I'm awake now. <laughs> Do you got a pad and a pencil? Kind of want to write this down. So that's... That's, do you, do you see that? The, the, the reality is actually greater than the imagery. Consider the lake of fire. Different apocalyptic literature, Revelation, John's Revelation, at the end of Revelation, it says the beast and all those who worshiped him were thrown into the lake of fire where they experienced torment forever and forever and forever. Amen. Okay, is that, does that, is that, is that unnerving? Yes. No one reads that and says, I kind of want to go to the lake of fire. <laughs> No one does. Everyone's like, what do I do to not be that person, right? Now, is the lake of fire literal? Might be. Might not be. Don't know. Now, some of you right now who are hardcore Bible enthusiasts, including myself, are like, oh, you're on a slippery slope, young man, <laughs> saying that that might not be literal. Listen, if it's not literal, and it probably is, but even if it's not, the reality is worse than a lake of fire. But the lake of fire is the best imagery that, that God could give a people with a limited capacity to understand things that they've never seen. In other words, it grabs you by the shoulders and shakes you, and you're like, <laughs> lake of fire? The reality's worse. Beast with iron teeth, the reality is worse. But I knew that if I gave you just the vision of kings with armies and soldiers and this and that, you're like, I've seen one army, I've seen them all. You just can't grab a hold of it. But the symbolism grabs our emotions, informs the mind, and it shakes our emotions as well. There is real power in imagery. Imagery moves us in a way that historical data just can't. Okay, how many of you, through high school or college, you had some, some introduction to the Holocaust, the liquidation of the Jews in World War II? Raise your hand, okay? Now, how many of you, in the middle of history class, as a senior in high school, burst into uncontrollable sobbing as you learned about this? Any of you? Okay, a few of you did. So we had this same question in the third service. I had about three or four people did raise their hand. How many of you didn't burst into uncontrollable sobbing? I didn't. You've seen me burst into uncontrollable sobbing when I preach. So it's not that I'm incapable of that. But historical data 
and, and times and dates and, and this and that, they don't necessarily move me. Okay, they, they can only, they can, but not to the degree that imagery does. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Schindler's List? Raise your hand. All right. I want to show you uh, some imagery here. It's not graphic. It's, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. But I want, to, I want to show you, essentially, when you're reading Daniel 7 through 12, this is a movie. God is essentially Schindler, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg here, and he's giving Daniel a picture uh, symbolically of what's going to happen that grabs his heart and rattles it in a way that historical data will never do. Okay, so you remember this scene? Schindler's List is, I can't even look at that picture without getting choked up. Schindler's List is all black and white. The whole movie from start to finish. Well, it starts with a, a yellow flame and then the flame becomes white because it goes to black and white. And then the rest of the movie until the end when you see this, the descendants of the survivors of, of uh, the concentration camp, everything's black and white except that little girl. She has a pink coat. And, and this, this picture here is the Nazis are, are, are rounding up all the Jews that have been in this ghetto for a while and they're, they're, moving, they're, they're moving all of the Jews from the ghetto to the work camps. Okay, so there's a transition. So it's like herding sheep to the slaughter, literally. And so they're herding all these people and you see all the Jews, they're grabbing their suitcases and they're all shuffling along and she's been separated from her parents. You, you never see her, she's always alone and she's always kind of wandering in the crowd. And the camera doesn't focus in on her per se, but you always see that. Your eye is drawn to it because it's the only thing that's in color, right? And, and you see some people running off and they're hiding and the guards are shooting at them and the dogs are barking. And then, then it's night and they've, they've cleared everybody out. But now the guards and the, and the dogs go back into the city and they find all those that are hiding and they shoot them and they execute them. And then you don't see the girl for a while. You have no idea where the girl is. And the movie goes on and the war, the, the war is drawing to an end. Schindler's trying to keep those people that he's He's, he, that are his, his workers, he's trying to keep them alive. And, and the, the, the Soviets are pushing in from the east and the, and the allies, the, the Americans and the British are pushing in from the west and Germany's being squeezed and they recognize they're going to be found out. So now they're destroying the evidence of war crimes. And so they have to dig up, they have to dig up the mass graves of that, that bloodletting that night when they moved everybody from the ghetto to the work camps and they have to burn all those bodies. And that's the next time you see the pink coat. And then you see the pink coat and the little girl go up a conveyor belt and drop over into a giant burning pile of bodies. And I saw that and I could not Stop weeping. That's what Daniel 7 through 12 is. I don't know the future, but I know for a great many people, even millions of people, it will end in a terrible plane crash. And for many people, the pain they will endure is unspeakable. And six million Jews burned in the gas chambers just doesn't evoke the imagery that a little girl in a pink coat does, does it? Do you see how that works? That's exactly, not exactly, but that's what's happening in Daniel. God is giving his people something very, very alarming to consider because the symbolism is freaky, but the reality is worse. Do you buy that? The reality is worse? Just look at the last century. The 20th century, more people were killed, murdered systematically by their own governments, by their own governments than all of the wars in history up until that time combined. 
But in history class, we're just not moved by that. Are we? I'm moved by that, though. If we had better projectors, you'd actually see that that's pink. But we don't, so. But that's it. That's what, it, that's what God's doing here. That's what God's doing here. So let's, let's look here. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. You think? In the visions of my head, they alarmed me. And I approached one of those who stood there, and I asked the truth concerning all this, and he told me and made known to me the interpretation. So the four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive a kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Okay, so in other words, God knows the beginning from the end. Everything's going to happen according to purpose. Some of it's going to be really, really bad. Some of it's going to be really, really bad. Now, we're going to start looking at that, but I want to give you some guidelines as we move forward. First of all, keep the main thing the main thing. We have 7 through 12 here. Each of these chapters, we're going to look at one major theme. There's a lot of sub-themes, tons of sub-themes. If we wanted to ver- analyze every sub-theme, we could draw Daniel out for the next three years, and we still wouldn't finish it. We're not going to do that. Now, if you want, you can go to our eschatology class, which looks at some of the blades of grass. We're not going to look at the blades of grass. We're going to look at at the forest, the major themes of, of each major chapter. So keep the main thing the main thing. Secondly, avoid foolish speculation. Every single year that the United States elects a president, some wingnut puts it on Facebook or the internet that that person is definitely the Antichrist. Or it's Putin. Or before Putin, it was Gorbachev. Okay, or it's some Ayatollah somewhere. That's the Antichrist. And then these people die. And then the person who made that prediction is like, well, I kind of feel dumb now. Well, actually, they never feel dumb. They just come up with the next one. Okay, they're not reading this pastorally. And and they have too much time on their hands. I'm almost positive, I don't want to judge because I don't know all these people, but I'm almost positive they're not really busy about the Great Commission. Because they're locked in a basement somewhere, filling out charts and trying to figure out which headline connects with Daniel 8 and so forth and so on. Okay, let's avoid that. Let's avoid that. By the way, the scriptures do connect to headlines in the future, but to spend all of our time trying to figure out if those headlines are today's misses the point entirely of Daniel and Revelation. Next, remember this is pastoral in nature. Keep that in mind. Remember, the people reading this for the first time and the people it was given to are uncertain about their future. They lived in exile. They lived in a, in a world in the first century where it was not legal to be a Christian and their lives were in peril because of that. Okay? Their biggest worry wasn't whether or not the University of Iowa basketball team's on the bubble and going to get in the NCAA. The, you understand what I'm saying? So when we read it that way, it helps us. It helps us. Third, be humble. It's okay if you don't understand. It really is. Look at verse 15 of chapter 7. What's Daniel say? My spirit was troubled within you, anxious, visions in my head. It was a, I approach one. I don't know what this means. I don't understand is what Daniel's saying. Look at verse 28, the end of the chapter. Here's the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me. And my color changed. He's freaked out, but I kept the matter in my heart. He's not really sure. He's been, they just explained what it all means and he still doesn't know what it means. And look at the end of chapter 8, his second vision. The end of chapter 8, verse 27. And I, Daniel, was overcome and I lay sick for some days. Then I arose and went about the king's business. But I was appalled by the visions and I didn't understand it. In other words, God gave me another vision and made me throw up and I still don't know what it means. Do, do you see that? It's okay to go through Daniel and not know exactly how this works. That's okay. That's okay. I've read some commentaries that say, clearly, clearly in Daniel chapter 9, this means this. I'm like, clearly? (laughs) Probably would be okay, but clearly? Daniel wanted to vomit at the end of his vision, but you're clear on this. (laughs) So I'm not saying that we can't know what it means, but just be cautious and be humble. 
be humble. Because when you're not humble, you're proud and you think you know it, and then you'll, tell, you'll say that Obama is actually the Antichrist. And then you see him on the news, kite surfing, you're like, oh, I guess it's not him now. <laughs> Don't I feel dumb? Because I'm pretty sure the, the Antichrist isn't kite surfing in the Caribbean right now. So I'm being funny, but I'm actually being quite serious. Don't do that. Don't do that. Be, be humble. Be humble. Now, as we, as we close, we're going to celebrate communion. And communion is not prophecy. The Lord's Supper was instituted by, by Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. So as you, as you get the, the, the juice and the, and, the, and the wafer, please hold them and I'll explain this. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, the Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, and after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. The bread and the juice are symbols that represent something greater than the symbols themselves. Jesus says, the bread is my body. It's being broken for you. The wine is my blood, which is being spilled for you. Now, here's the point. Let me connect all of this together. Apocalyptic literature ties the past with the present with the future. Now I want you to look at the last verse here in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread, present, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, past, until he returns, future. In other words, get on the plane, kids. It may or may not come down safely. But my body's being broken for you. And I will be crushed. And I will be broken. And I will spill all my blood. And I will bring you home safe. Come hell or high water, you will rest with me forever. And I'm giving you this juice and I'm giving you this bread so that every time you eat of it and every time you drink of it, you won't forget the greater reality that these things represent. So never lose sight of the gospel. Whether the times ahead look bright and sunny and safe or dark and stormy and uncertain, the end of the matter is secure. And he secured it for you on the cross. So hold on to that and we'll come back and take communion together. Well, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and he, he actually broke the bread and he gave him the wine, he'd spent a bunch of hours with them and they were all messed up because they had a vision for the future and they were going to reign with Jesus. And um, Jesus is telling them, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going away. And they're all freaking out. They're like, that's not, that's not the future. No, 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 Jesus, that's not it. That's not, no. And he's like, no, yes, the plane's coming down. Kids, it ends today. It's over. But it's not over. And for some of you, you don't know your future. Some of you, your future is very, very bleak right now. You're hurting. Your sin, someone else's sin, that diagnosis, and you're afraid, and that's okay. But you have to remember that the one who gave his body for you and his blood for you secured your future. That's why we do this. So let's give him thanks and do it together. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you that you know the, the end from the beginning, and we don't have to. We just have to know that you secured the end for us. Lord, we receive this bread and this juice, gratefully recognizing that it represents something so much greater. The reality is your death, your burial, and your resurrection, and your union with you, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. So we thank you for that and receive it with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, as we go forth from here today, back to our homes, back to our jobs, just like Daniel, we've got to wake up, we've got to write the vision down, and now I've got to go to work tomorrow. Lord, help us to work and to live and to play in light of the greater reality that you're returning. And then when you return, you will establish a kingdom forever and ever. And you will abolish death and you will abolish sin. And let our hope be there. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Go in grace. We'll see you next week.